Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters, and key figures from the publishing industry, plus loads of hints, tips, and inspiration for all kinds of creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review, or just tell a friend. Right, cue that cheesy theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can and often does go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 117 with David Warple, an award-winning screenwriter based in L.A., I first came across David after reading his excellent Twitter thread giving tips on how to avoid overwriting action lines in a screenplay. I'll put that uh, link in the show notes because his stuff about anchoring nouns, visual writing and how to consider scale in your description can be applied to any writing medium. My only regret is that I forgot to actually get around to talking about that during our interview, but I'd love to get David back on at some stage anyway to do more of a deep dive on the mechanics of writing for the screen. Today's chat is interesting regardless of whether you're interested in screenwriting or not. We touched on story, self-reflection, specificity, it's a difficult word to say, uh, when writing characters, and even how you should consider measuring your success as a creative, so it was great. Um, and it's a, a great conversation to fill your creative well as we hurtle towards the end of the year. For my part, I've been redrafting a short script that will go into production next year, as well as tentatively making notes on an idea I've got for a feature-length script. And after a few online conversations with writer friend Victoria Goldman, I've been inspired to get back on the submissions trail with my novel Safe Hands. So the Christmas break should give me some headspace and time to plan my next wave of attack with that. So that's what I've been up to, but what about you? Let me know and get in touch by tweeting me at JUPodcast or emailing wayne at waynekellywrites.com as I'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk to get free stuff and to be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's crack on with today's interview with David Warple. David is an award-winning screenwriter living in Sherman Oaks, California. After several years working in video production, he relocated to LA to focus on writing, specialising in what he describes as grounded genre features. His most recent feature, Long Gone By, was an official selection of the 2019 New York Latino Film Festival. In addition to his various writing assignments, he also offers a script consultancy service, and you can find more info at davidwarple.com. And it was great to chat via Skype just a few days ago. Okay, David, thanks a million for joining me on Join Up Writing. I really appreciate it. So um, just to start us off, why don't you just tell listeners uh, where you are and what sort of time it is there and what you've been up to? I am in Sherman Oaks, California. It is 11.30 a.m. Sherman Oaks is in the, uh, the San Fernando Valley, just sort of on the other side of the hills from Beverly Hills. So I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, Mm -hmm. county in the valley and yeah i'm just in my apartment i was doing some writing earlier and now here talking to you so very excited yeah that's great thanks thanks for joining me i appreciate it so so why don't you just start us off just tell us a little bit about your background where you kind of grew up and and some of the stuff you did before you decided you want to pursue a career in writing so i grew up in north carolina on the east coast of the united states and I went to school there on the coast. I went to film school, and I also studied philosophy there. And I thought that I'd actually work in production. I originally thought I wanted to do cinematography. And so I was in a lot of the production classes. And doing the work on some of the films, I realized that a lot of the choices that I thought uh, a cinematographer was making, a director was making. So then I, I sort of moved into that a little bit, or at least tried to and realized that there was a lot more to directing than explicitly what I was interested in. And it seemed that it was mostly writing. 
So I moved to Atlanta, where I heard a lot of film was uh, going on, Atlanta, Georgia, and got into video and film production there, was doing just sort of everything at a small boutique production company, doing post-production, production, we were doing commercials, music videos, short films, feature films, just kind of all over. So I got a good hand in every aspect of the process, but my writing had sort of fallen off to, to the wayside. And, and a few years ago, I thought it was the time to really get serious and moved out here to pursue writing professionally. Brilliant. So how do you think, I mean, because we we've, sounds like we've got similar backgrounds from the point of view that we've both got practical experience of video production stuff. How do you think that sort of fed into your writing now and specifically writing for the screen? Is that something that's kind of you, you bear in mind when you're putting a script together? I do, and I, I try to sometimes in, actually block that out at times depending on, on sort of where I am in, in a project because it is very useful, but sometimes – that thinking of like, oh, how will this be shot or what might this cost has previously gotten in my way of just creating freely. So sometimes I try to not think about that and just write. And then I'll go back in later when I'm thinking about, okay, now th this project, now that I know this story, how do I think this will best be positioned to get made? And I might try to tone down a few production aspects or sometimes if I might just beef it up if I think, you know what, this is just big. And if it's going to be big, I might as well go big and, you know, just up the production value on the page. But I think having an eye for it is always helpful when writing of understanding where this might go, how this might get made, and what are some of the obstacles that a production team will encounter based on the words on your page. Yeah, absolutely. And and do you think it helps you from sort of an editing point of view as well in terms of thinking how you get from A to B and how one scene might link to another scene and, and even to a certain extent whether you need a scene or not? Yeah, absolutely. I did a lot of the work that I was doing when I was in Atlanta was post-production. Probably 75% of everything that I was doing, I was in front of the screen cutting. And it really taught me a lot. It's basically like writing except you – already have the words that you can use in front of you. And so it really taught me the way to convey information through juxtaposing images or d different images. It's one of the things that's unique about cinema is that you're conveying information across two different images. So two different images create new meaning that both of those images don't necessarily have on their own. And it's the most unique thing that we do, I think, compared to, to to novel writing or a stage play. It's this control of the images and going from one to another. So thinking about that when I'm writing always helps lean into the strength of the medium that is screenwriting. Yeah. Well, what, what would you say is your earliest memory of writing? What, what did you enjoy about it? Or when did you realize that you might have a talent for it? I think that I realized I might have a talent for it in high school. Um, I, whenever there was the option to do a project as a video, I would always do that. And especially a group project. And I realized that I was doing my best work, not being in front of the camera, but more ushering the project together seeing how all the different pieces fit together. My friends were much funnier than me, so I said, you'll, you'll go in front of the camera, just talk forever, mm -hmm. I'll cut it up later. I, I learned editing in high school, and the projects would turn out very well. Not only would I get decent grades, but people would come up to me and say, hey, I heard in fourth period you put this video together for your project. I heard it was really good. Can I, do you mind if I watch it? And we'd start having these screenings over our lunch period. People would come to the library. We had a little room on the side with a... a DVD player and a TV and people from other periods and then other classes would come and watch the videos that I was making, me and my friends. And there was something really enjoyable about that, about creating something and putting it in front of people and seeing people respond to it. And I thought, not only am I decent at this, but this feels good. This this is fulfilling and this might be something I want to pursue. I'd always loved movies growing up and 
I never really considered where I would be in the industry, but I think I knew early on I wanted to do it. And it was in high school that I sort of started believing that I could. And it's a lot easier to get somebody to watch your film rather than read your book. I, I know from experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. May, I wonder if that's part of why I'm, I'm doing this and not uh, writing prose. Uh, did you, have you ever tried to write prose or is that anything that you've kind of dallied with in the past or anything? Not in any serious way. I think about it, but I think I'm more interested in sort of the romantic idea of being an author and I don't think I'm actually as fulfilled doing the work. No, I, I know what you mean. I think it's that, I, th I mean, having, uh, having done both, I think that one of the biggest differences is the fact that you sort of have to focus on um, a project for such a long period of time. I mean, I know that, you know, there's an element of that with filmmaking because, you know, you write lots and lots of drafts and then if you're lucky enough for it to go into production, you might be involved in that. And then there's a, that's a whole different thing as well. But yeah, with a book, you tend to be, you know, it's something that you do pretty much on your own, um, you know, with very little collaboration, at, at least until you get to the very end part when you might be looking at publishing it or something. So I think that's another aspect of it. Was collaboration, it sounds like from what you've said with how you got started and when you were at school and stuff, collaboration was quite a big, important, important part for you as well. Yeah, I really like that aspect of it. And I think that's why I was working in production for a while before getting to writing is because that team mentality of everyone has their specific task, but they all serve this larger vision. I was really really attracted to and I really love and I, I do miss production and occasionally here in LA I'll, I'll pick up some some production gigs just to sort of relive that a little bit because it is very fun it's a grind and I, I think one of the reasons I gravitated to writing besides just being a little more fulfilled creatively was that life I didn't think that I could keep up um, it's long days in and out uh, and I just, I didn't think I could sustain it, but I do miss that kind of bunker mentality of like, we're here, we have this assignment and we're all pulling our weight and helping each other to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. So, so why do you write? What, what kind of drives you to sit in that chair every day and bash out the words? I think I'm still learning that myself actually, but I'd say it's something along the lines of being able to create an emotional reaction in someone else. The writing, I think, is where it begins and structuring a story so that it can move someone else and hopefully move them in a meaningful way is very fulfilling to me. And I think that's why I do it. I think I, I sit down and I, if I can tell a story worth telling, and empathetically move someone through that story, then I think I've done my job. So, so how do you kind of approach it? Have you got kind of a set way of approaching it? Is it a case of you've got an idea and you just start, a, the, you know, an idea for a scene, and you just start writing and you see where it goes and then you kind of edit later or do you beat everything out and you work out exactly where you're going and you know your path? So if you're sitting down to write, a, say, a, a new feature tomorrow, what, how would you approach it? What I would do is, if, if I'm writing a feature that is my idea, if I'm doing something on spec, I get a notebook for each new idea that I'm about to seriously pursue. I, I keep another notebook that's just ideas and that's just random thoughts. And, but then when I'm like, you know, this is the one I think I'm going to go after next, I'll get a book specifically for that project. I'll usually try to make the notebook somehow thematically fit into the thing so if i'm writing a futuristic thriller my notebook would look like a sleek and sci-fi and all that stuff i don't know it's just some, <laughs> yeah. something fun but then I'll, I'll start sort of writing in longhand in that notebook just ideas and scenes sometimes i'll start writing a scene even if i don't know where it's going to fit in or just any thoughts what what really interests me in the project oh i really want uh, a chase scene that takes place through a shopping mall. And I might just kind of write out what that scene might look like, just sketch it. And it's all longhand. And I think of this as like sort of collecting scraps of the idea. And I just do that until I feel like it's really gelled enough 
then I'm going to start going after the whole story. I think the themes are starting to come through and I start to realize I'm discovering what I'm interested in myself. What, what part of this idea is most interesting to me and that's probably why I'm interested in writing it. That theme will hopefully bubble up a little bit to the surface and then I'll start writing the story and I'll try to write it as small as possible, even like a sentence. What is the whole story from beginning to end? And then I'll take that sentence and once I, I'll rewrite it in different ways. And once that gets to something that feels like something I want to write, I'll try to build that out into a, a paragraph maybe. But I'm sort of trying to see the story as a whole and then fill it out from the inside until I just keep doing this over and over. It gets getting bigger and bigger until I get to a treatment and a very large treatment. And I feel like I've kind of written the story at that point. And once I have that treatment, then taking it to a draft feels a little bit more like a translation. Now I'm just putting it into screenwriting format. I'm adding the dialogue and really getting to those nooks and crannies of what image do I want the reader to see right now? What are the idiosyncrasies of these characters that didn't come out in that treatment? It's all those little things because I feel very comfortable with the story and the theme and the structure that I get to play around there. But I think taking it from that treatment to that script is where most of the work of screenwriting really comes in. I think at earlier I'm more in a sort of just general storytelling mode. Is this story worth telling and what's going to happen in it? And then I can sort of trust that I did my work as a storyteller and then give my screenwriter the reins. That's interesting. And it sounds like a, a good way to approach it because by doing that, the first, the thing that comes first before anything else is the story rather than just some cool characters and a few nice bits of dialogue. Yeah. And I think that, that collecting scraps sort of part of the process early on is where I'm doing that. I'm just writing the characters. I'm just doing what I'm just anything that comes into my mind about this thing. And a lot of that doesn't make it into the story, but it starts to help me discover what I'm really interested in. And it's, I think it's crucial to have all that just bouncing around in my head so that when I'm in that sort of filling out the story from the inside part, it's all there for me to access and play with. So a lot of people that have never tried script writing or they might have read a little bit about it or maybe they've seen a few scripts and maybe they've done a little bit of prose writing or, or whatever, that they're intrigued by the idea of screenwriting but then they see a script <laughs> and they see the kind of the formatting of it and stuff and they get really they can get really really kind of bogged down with it and kind of um intimidated by it is that something that you kind of you were familiar with when you started getting into the medium or is it something you just embraced early on i think i was resistant to the benefits of screenwriting there there are formatting rules but it's actually a lot freer than i really thought it was at first i was writing my action lines in complete sentences because i thought that's how they should be written and it was really difficult for me to get out of that but once i did i realized oh this is great i'm not actually pulled into the rules of grammar and punctuation i can i have a little bit more freedom to kind of do whatever as long as it's working for this moment that I'm trying to convey then everything is kind of fair game and that was a real turning point for me in terms of my writing and my reads got a lot faster and leaner and the moments were coming through a little bit more i had read tons of screenwriting books but i i forget where i heard it but someone said the most helpful screenwriting book to them was a book on writing music lyrics. And so I picked up a book on writing music lyrics and just sort of was paging through it and looking at the way they're thinking about it. And that turned me on to some books of uh, poetry that I was looking at. And once I sort of started seeing there's a lot more freedom in the format than structure, uh, it really opened up some avenues for me in terms of conveying images through words on a page. That's interesting, the music lyrics and the poetry. Do you think some of that is to do with economy, economy of words and saving space and getting to it quickly and quicker than you would? In yeah, a, in absolutely. 
and 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 rhythm to a certain extent as well yeah totally the a, a longer line of action you might want to intentionally be over long to make it feel a little laborious or slow but if it's not then a, sort of a, abandon the grammar and just really punch in with the things that you need to convey and trust that the audience is going to be there with you and and when you first do you remember well do you remember the very first script that you wrote do you look ever look back on that now and have a read of it or whatever or is that something that got made or the very first script i wrote in a in a sort of serious way i'd written stuff in college but nothing really that i i i took very seriously but the first one i was like i'm going to write a screenplay i was very scared of where it might be able to get made. And I thought, well, maybe I'll try and write a stage play. And I was like, I don't actually know anything about that either. So I sort of wrote this thing that lives in this uncanny valley between the two. And it's this incredibly boring sci-fi spaceship thriller, but it only takes place on the bridge of the spaceship. So you never seen it in the action. It's this crazy thing. And I think it's a great story, but a bad script, if that makes sense. And it's because sure, yeah. I was beholden to these ideas of what it should be and not really thinking about what I wanted out of this story, what I was interested in this what, story. What sort of, when you say you were sort of s certain ideas you thought that it, it should be or you, that you thought made a script or whatever, what were those ideas at the time? Do you remember? I think a lot of it had to do with formatting and that what it should look like on the page. And I will say a lot of those ideas I think were wrong. It's not that I was beholden to wrong ideas. I was writing, like I said, in full prose lines for all of my action lines. And all of my characters were speaking in absolutely correct grammar. And they, a lot of them spoke very similarly because they were all speaking how I speak. And once I broke out of that in, in subsequent scripts, all of a sudden these worlds started to come to life much more because they had voices that were my own, but a little bit different. I was edging them away from me. Whereas those early ones, it was, every character was a lot more how I talk and how I think. And figuring out how to get out of that really helped create characters that come to life a little bit more there's that old trick isn't there that you can do you can do it when you write prose as well where you cover over the names of the characters and you try to and you and you have a look again at the dialogue and if you can't tell who's saying what then then something's not quite right that sounds like a similar thing to what you're talking about yeah absolutely absolutely you should just be able to read it off the page and say oh that's that's Janine or that's David or whatever, just just from reading the actual dialogue. Yeah, and it's totally true. The last spec that I wrote, once the character voices started to come into focus, I would give it to people to read, and they'd be able to call out. They'd say, hey, this line, he wouldn't say that, at least not that yeah. way. And I had yeah. written enough of the character for them to get a sense of how they spoke, that the lines that weren't true were sticking out like sore thumbs. So it was really helping that once you figure out those little ways that people speak and their worldviews and how they infuse their dialogue with those worldviews, it starts to become clear who says what in what way. And, and so why don't you, on, on that theme, why don't you tell us a little bit about your um, recently produced film, Long Gone By? Sure. Sure. Long Gone By, I wrote the screenplay for. I came in on, I think, the fourth draft of a project. And I was put in touch with the director from some, some mutual friends. And we just met up for a casual coffee, not thinking about that, that this was any sort of interview for a job or anything. It was just, you know, we had some friends in common. They said, hey, you should go meet this guy, hang out. Um, so we, we met up. And he was telling me about his, his project which didn't have a, a time. And I just 
gave him a few thoughts. He was asking a few questions. And then about two days later, he calls and he says, hey, I really like what you're saying. Would you like to rewrite this movie? And I said, well, what do you, what do you, what do you mean rewrite it? And he's like, well, I'm just not – I think the script is good. I think the story is good, but I think it could be better. And I think I need a writer to come on and, and shape it up. And I said, sure, what, what are you looking for? And he told me, well, you, have, you can keep the same characters, the same idea, the same locations. Everything else you can move around, get rid of as you see fit. So it was this really interesting sort of project where I had a lot of freedom within a very clearly defined box. Because he was moving into production in just a few weeks. So he said, I have all these, these characters are mostly cast, all the big parts. And the story idea has to be there because that's the story that I have set up production for. But structurally, you can play around. And so the story is about an immigrant mother in small town, middle America. And her daughter gets into college, but they can't afford it. And this all happens almost the same day that the mother finds out she's about to be deported. She's here legally, but her visa will not be renewed. And she has about two weeks to either leave the country or she will now be here illegally. And so she sees this moment of her daughter possibly going to school or leaving this country that they came here for just for this opportunity. So the mother turns to robbing banks. And that's where I kind of leaned in. I was like, well, tell me more about the bank robbing part. Um, and it was this really interesting project, figuring out structurally, do we lead with the news about she's getting into, she got into college, but they can't afford it? Do we lead with the news about the visa not being renewed? Where structurally do we start? What is the inciting incident? All those questions were still up in the air when we went to rewrite it. And really thinking about what is the theme of this story? What is the plot of this story and how does it serve the theme really helped us make those decisions. And I think it turned out very well because of those discussions. Okay, I wanted to take a quick break there just to remind you to leave your five-star ratings and reviews on iTunes, Stitcher or Overcast or wherever else it is that you listen if it's Spotify because it really helps other people to find the show. But even if you've already done that or you can't find the time, at least tell someone else about it online or face-to-face. It doesn't matter whether they write or not. I think there's plenty of stuff here for anyone interested in creativity or just looking to be inspired by the creativity of others. So make it a New Year's resolution and tell at least five other people about the show and I'll be immensely grateful. So thanks a million. Right, let's get back to my chat with David Warple where I asked David how he got into the business in the first place. So so how did you break in in the first place? Do you, was there sort of a single script that did it or was it something that built up over time well i'd say in many ways i'm still breaking in i know some people say that you're always breaking in Mm -hmm. um but in terms of how i got the relationships i have in the industry it was through moving to la and i interned at three different places uh even though i had worked in Atlanta, I produced some relatively big projects. They, I was not known as a writer. So I came out here, started a little bit from the ground up, and I interned at a talent agency. I interned at a management company, and I interned at a production company. And the talent agency, I was doing submissions for, for actors and um, actresses, commercial and theatrically. So that was a, a little bit sort of a side of what I wanted to do. But then at the management company and the production company, I was reading scripts up to three a day usually and providing coverage. So I was reading a lot and I was seeing what people were writing. I was overhearing a lot of conversations between 
the managers and their clients, the managers and producers that they were looking to connect their clients with. And those relationships are what helped me get projects to people to look at my work. And and it sounds like that was a, a lot of hard work and probably for not a lot of pay for a lot of the time. So you had to sort of, you know, really knuckle down and get it done. Yeah, it's a lot. And I was doing the management company was an in-person internship a few days a week and the production company was remotely. So there were days where I would read three scripts at the management company in the office, come home and then one or two more that night. And I was providing coverage for each one, which is essentially a book report on the script. And so you were sort of having to give a synopsis of what it was and then what you thought on it, your your opinion as well. Yeah, you have a, a quick synopsis and then just highlight, here's what this writer is doing very well. Here are some things that this script, if you wanted to pursue it further, it might need some attention. And at the management company, I was looking a little bit more at the writer and the voice. And at the production company, I was looking a little bit more at the project itself. And is this something that the production company would want to produce? And and how much does that commercial aspect figure for you? I mean, I mean, obviously, it figures, it's a huge part of the film industry. But for you personally, when you're writing projects or if you're writing spec scripts or whatever, how big a, a thing is the commercial aspect of it in your mind when you're writing something or when you're putting something together for my spec scripts i try not to think about it mm -hmm. and sometimes i wonder if it's still in the back of my head but i try not to if i have a project that i think is going to go to a certain producer then i will talk with them before even writing kind of where this might live in terms of budget and location space. We're thinking about distribution, where it might find a home for people to see. And that will help before I even go into the script and write it, determine where, what I can and cannot do. But for my spec work, I try to really hone in on the story and make sure that all of my choices are coming from that and I'm not putting things in just because I think it'd be cool or I think it needs to be bigger or I think it needs to be smaller, but I'm really mm -hmm. zeroing in on what serves this story. So for, for people out there that are thinking of even just trying to just start looking at screenwriting or maybe give it a try, have you got any advice? What What's the best what would you say is the best place to start? I think the best place to start is reading screenplays. Absolutely. And there's a lot more available online than there used to be. And every award season, they release them online usually. And you can look there at ones that have been made, produced, especially if they're nominated for screenplay, if they're nominated for adapted screenplay, that's really useful to look at, especially if you're familiar with the material it's adapted from, because that you can really zero in on what does this screenplay look like compared to what does this novel look like or what does this um, stage play look like? And you can see those differences a little bit clearer. But I'd recommend reading really well done screenplays and then also reading screenplays from writers that are just starting out and just trying it. So you can start to see the things that aren't working, why they're not. And you'll start to see differences between the stuff that is made and produced and well received and things that are just not quite at that level yet. And how do you go about getting feedback? I mean, did you yourself as you were coming up and presumably now when you're writing things, have you got like a, a sort of circle of trusted readers or did you were you members of on, an online forum? How did you go about getting feedback on your work? I have a few friends that I send my work to and usually at various points. So I have some friends 
that I'll send them the treatment and just get their thoughts. And sometimes I will just meet up for coffee and just say, hey, can I sort of talk this story out loud to you? And they get to be a little bit of a mirror for me and say, I think actually what you're interested in is a theme of leadership. It's like, oh, yeah, well, you just keep repeating this thing and maybe you should look at that. Um, so before I even go in, I'll start kind of getting those ideas in front of people. And then once I get to later stages of the project, especially after, after I get a first draft, I'll, and then I'll go through and I'll do like a very small rewrite, just if there's anything that really stands out early, I'll do that. And then I'll send that version to a number of people, hopefully like up to like four or five. And I tried to send it to people that I know and know my work well, but also maybe mm. newer connections or a little bit looser connections, people that aren't really invested in me personally with that relationship. So if they're willing to do it, they're going to give me pretty stark feedback, whether they like it or not. Yeah. And once I get all those notes and feedback back, I will I'll see which notes overlap and which ones I agree with, which ones I disagree with. And usually the ones I disagree with are pointing to other problems that I'm avoiding or that are perhaps I'm blind to. And mm -hmm. from those notes, I won't necessarily address them directly, but I'll make a plan of attack for the next rewrite. Okay, I'm going to go in and I'm going to try to make this character's motivation clearer. And hopefully, if I've done my work in assessing those notes correctly, that will address a number of them. And what starts to happen is other notes that were seemingly unrelated start to fall away because they actually are solved by this one or two bigger problems that a lot of everything else is stemming from. And if they aren't falling away, they start to show up in a little bit starker relief so that I can see, oh, this is what that note was about. That, that character's voice just isn't consistent or that character's motivation isn't honest or you know a truthful thing that humans do. So it's just not reading very well. Um, mm -hmm. And I need to make that a little bit more real. Th those sort of things start to pop up as clear problems. Well, what sort of issues do you tend to see in early drafts or, or the early versions um, that you see from new writers? I mean, I don't know how many times that you see stuff from new new writers or whatever, but new people that, are, that haven't been doing it too long. What are some of the common mistakes that people tend to make when they first start out, would you say? I think a common mistake I see is avoiding specificity. And so a lot of the times their dramatic scenes read as melodrama because it's mm -hmm. people saying exactly what they're thinking and feeling. And I used to say that, oh, you should hide this in subtext, but that's kind of a vague note. It's not very actionable. And mm -hmm. so now I always just say, just like look for specifics and figure out what these characters wear, what they do, what they like, and make them specific. And that specificity will often yield opportunities to hide these things in subtext. And it was a script that I read a few years ago, and this character was always eating a candy bar. And I asked the writer, I said, what candy bar do they eat? And she's like, I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that up to production. I'm like, no, you should put that in. And because I'm really curious about what kind of candy bar this person is eating, and it will tell them a lot about the character. And then I read a later draft, and she had turned this candy bar into a metaphor for the relationship. It was a, a road trip film about a mother and daughter, and the mother never listened to the daughter. She never really listened to her. And so as they're on this road trip, and they're occasionally stopping in to get snacks, and the mother is buying this candy bar, and she's always giving her, the daughter, 
the wrong candy bar. She's like, I like a, I like Snickers, but the mother's always just bringing out Kit Kat or Three Musketeers or these are all American candy bars. I don't know what's over there. So uh, <laughs> we have Snickers and Kit Kat. Okay, so, so you're these, good. two out of good, three is not some, bad. All right, yeah. so there's some trans. <laughs> um, and at the end of the film, near the end, she comes and gets in the car and just passes over a Snickers. And what was originally this whole scene of the mother saying, I'm sorry I didn't listen to you, and I'm going to be better, and I want to listen to you and be there for you, all she did was pass us her this Snickers that is now a metaphor for, I, I heard you. I heard that you wanted this, and I got this for you. And mm-hmm. originally, my note was just like, I'm, I'm curious what candy bar this, this character like. That's where it led. But yeah. by giving that gift of specificity early on, it yielded this wonderful moment that is now subtext. The mom doesn't have to say, I hear you. She can just pass her a Snickers candy bar, which of course out of context makes no sense. But now within the story of the script, in context, you have that wonderful distinction between text and subtext. And you get that her passing her this candy bar that is the very specific one she's always asking for that her mother never gives her is communicating, I hear you, I love you. And our relationship is, is, is going to be good from here. And so I always just say specificity early to, to earlier writers. I, I do script consulting as well. And so this is a thing that I go back to all the time. And because you never know what it might yield later by giving yourself those gifts of specifics early on. Yeah, that's true. And that's a really good example. It's also a case that it's usually the case that people rarely say what they mean. You usually get a better sense of what they mean through what they do. You kind of learn who the person is through their actions and particularly in a screenplay, um, because that's kind of what you're aiming to do to create, you know, to, to see the characters come alive through their actions and the story told through their actions. And that's usually the way. And characters often, they say the opposite of what they mean, don't they? Yeah. Which is another... Which is like life. Yeah, you know, which is another specific common. way that you can hide your text in subtext. You know, when someone comes in and says, how's your day? And they say, fine. But they say it very sharply. Mm-hmm. Then you know it's not fine. But it feels a little bit more mm-hmm. real to life. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, what? So, what would you say has been your biggest challenge or roadblock that you faced along the way, and and how did you manage to uh, overcome it, or maybe you're still trying to overcome it? I think it's sitting down and writing, doing doing the work, and I think personally, it's because this is what I want to do. This is what I've discovered is what I really want to do and make a career and a life out of. And so I find myself often distracting myself with other endeavors. And I think it's because deep down I know if I fail at those other things, it's okay because I'm not failing at the thing I want to do. And so sitting down and putting the time in to really write and put myself out there on the page is sometimes tough. And something that helped me, I I still struggle with this, but something that helped me was when I stopped counting, when I stopped measuring my progress by scenes or pages or meetings or sales or anything like that and went to sort of a a timed-based measurement, like I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write for two hours straight this morning. Mm -hmm. And at the end of two hours, I'm done. Whether I'm feeling great, whether I'm feeling terrible, whether I think the work is great, whether I think the work is terrible, but two hours I put in my time and, and that's that this morning. Um, really helped get my mind into a place where it felt a little bit more like I'm going to the gym. I won't see exact progress but showing up is really what matters. And if I'm showing up day after day, then 
the work will take care of itself. And so when I used to think of it in terms of, all right, I'm going to get through eight pages today, or I'm going to finish this scene, it was really difficult because sometimes I would do that and it'd only take 45 minutes to get through that scene. And I realized that that was much shorter than I thought it would be. But maybe it's because I didn't really dig in. Maybe it's because I I started second guessing myself on what I was doing. And then other times where it's like, I'm getting nowhere on the page, but I told myself I would write five pages today. And I've been here for four hours and my brain is mush and I have nothing to show for it. So getting out of that mindset helped me get into a little more of, I, I hope, a, a professional attitude of just show up, do the work and trust the process. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's the amount of thought that's involved in, in any kind of creative endeavor anyway. And as you say, that doesn't always immediately translate to words on the page or paint on the canvas or whatever it is that you're doing, does it? Right. And it's still scary. I still find myself doing other things that I love and am very excited to do. And I always, you know, rationalize as they'll help me in my career and they'll do things for me. But I think I'm really avoiding the work. I think that's where I probably struggle the most of just sitting down and doing the work that I've discovered. I feel like I meant to do. Yeah, well, that's great. That's really inspiring. And and as we kind of move to wrap things up, what, you might not just have this on the top of your head and it's fine if you don't, but what would you say is the most helpful piece of creative or inspirational advice, advice that you've been given? I think two things I'll say. And one is a quote. I can't remember I first heard it, but the quote is, hard work is not a guarantor of success, but it is a prerequisite. Mm-hmm. And I think I go back to that often because I think it nicely situates me in a mentality of I won't get anything without hard work, but just because I'm working hard doesn't mean that anyone owes me anything. And so I find it both inspiring and humbling to think about in terms of how I navigate this work in this industry is that I have to work hard, but just because I am doesn't mean that I'll get something out of it. The, the art also has to be great and maybe it's not there yet. And maybe I'll continue that hard work to get there. And then the other thing is, Learn who you are. Do the self-reflection it takes to discover what you're interested in, both in terms of the career, you know, why I'm interested in screenwriting, but also the types of stories I'm interested in as a screenwriter. And I think if I had done some of that self-reflection earlier on, I think it would have really helped my craft. I think you can't get by just on the tricks and tips of writing a screenplay without really infusing yourself into it. And it's really hard to infuse yourself into your work if you don't know yourself. And I'm still learning about myself and and discovering things as I continue to dig deeper. But I really was looking for a lot of external sources earlier on in my career rather than looking internally about who I am, what I bring to the table, but also what I'm interested in. And not only did that help my craft, my writing got better, but also my professional and personal relationships all got better. I was a much better collaborator. I was much better at taking notes and giving notes. A lot of things really opened up for me once I started doing work on myself. And I now will only ever continue to think in that mode and continue to work on myself as it's going to not only help me professionally, but hopefully personally as well. Yeah, it's great. It sounds like it sounds like a good tip. It's a good life tip as well as a good writing tip. So thanks very much. Hey, of course. So 
So, yeah, just so finally then, so what's up next? And um, tell people where they can find out more about you and find you online. Sure. You can find me on Twitter. I am at David Wapple. And Wapple is W-A-P-P-E-L. Uh, a lot of times it people put L-E, but it is E-L. Um, on Twitter, I have a website, davidwapple.com. I'm not as good as I should be about keeping it updated, but I, I think uh, I have some stuff there. And up next is a couple more specs. I'm doing my first TV pilot right now. I've only ever done features as far as what I've written. And it's been real fun to start getting into. I'm in that treatment story sort of phase that I described in my process. So I'm still figuring out what this story is. and. It's been really fun to think about what sort of story loops are closed at the end of this pilot and which ones are open. Which ones do I start but don't finish? Which ones do I merely point to as a possibility? It's really a challenge that I've enjoyed and do something different. It's always good to be a beginner at something, and I feel like a total newbie in terms of writing a television pilot, so that's been very enjoyable. Excellent. Really exciting stuff. Yeah. Well, it's great. Well, it's been really, really good to talk to you, David. Really appreciated it. And um, good luck with all your projects coming up. But for now, thanks a lot for coming on Joined Up Writing. Of course. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks again to David Warple. And you should definitely check out his website, blog, and Twitter. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That's it for this week and indeed for this year, 2019. But don't forget, you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And that way you can have a show downloaded automatically every single time it comes out. Also, remember to get in touch with all your writing news, views, questions or comments and I'll give you a mention in a future show. I also wanted to thank you all for another year of listening and contributing to the show and to wish you all a very happy Christmas and productive New Year. The next episode will see a return of another screenwriter, UK-based CJ Wally, um, before we get back to novelists with another episode later in January. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading and I'll see you next year. Up.